Well, all right. Welcome back to As You Should Be. Paul Berlino here. And, uh, well, Happy New Year. It's the end of 2021. And, well, I mean, good, right? Everybody's so excited because the end of 2021. Because, of course, 2020 is just automatically going to be so much better, right? Isn't that always the case? Because, like, you know, at the end of 2020, everybody was really excited for that, you know, horrendous year to end. Because, of course, Jan come January 1st, 2021, suddenly COVID's just going to be gone and everything's just going to be great, right? Come on, people. But, you know, I mean, I guess we have to have something to kind of, you know, hang our hopes on, right? But just the same, that doesn't mean that great things can't happen uh, or the great music can't come out. Some great music came out in 2021. Uh, some great songs, certainly, and that's really what this video is about. I am going to count down my top 10 favorite songs of 2021, or favorite tracks or whatever. Um, and now, I've been doing best of lists at the end of the year for most of the last decade or so. I started around 2012, and at the end of that year, I thought, why don't I just do a... I, I, I ch it was a challenge. I thought, can I, I'm going to challenge myself. Can I actually make a, a list of 10 songs from this year that I actually really loved? And I was actually able to do it, you know, post it on Facebook or whatever with YouTube links below. And it, then it became a thing after that. I just started doing it every single year. And it got to the point, really, where the, al where the albums started getting better every year. I started getting to the point where I could actually post top 10 favorite albums of the year. And the best of the lot so far was 2019. So many great albums that year. And, I, I mean, I had to end I ended up having to leave albums off that list because there were so many. But then 2020 happened, and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so, this year, I'm back to just songs, because there just weren't that many albums from this past year that I was really into. Now, there may be, you know, there could be 10, 20, or 30 albums from the past year that I would really love. I just don't know about them. Because that's the thing. Sometimes I'll discover things and go, oh, wow, this is really great, and go, oh, well, that's from last year or two years ago, and I just didn't discover it in its time. So, you know. Probably just things I ain't hip to, man, from this year. So I'm doing the best I can do from what I know about this year so far. So, uh, all right, well, well, let's get into it. Okay, so coming in at number 10 is Mickey Dolan's with Don't Wait For Me. Now, this is from his Dolan Sings Nesmith album, which came out in May. And it's now this album is sort of modeled after the great Harry Nilsson album, Nilsson Sings Newman, which came out in 70, 71. Now, Harry Nilsson, of course, did this great album where he did a whole program of Randy Newman covers. Uh, you know, sort of a tribute album of sorts, I guess, um, where he did his sort of own arrangements and his own production of them. And, well, Mickey Dolenz, who was a great, great friend of Harry Nilsson's, they were very, very tight. He's not only a fan of, of Nilsson, but, of course, Mike Nesmith. So he decided that he was going to do the same thing, but with Nesmith tunes. And, well, Mike Nesmith was, of course, still with us at the time and was very on board with this project. And they were, and he was very, he, he, he supported it all the way. And Mickey, he teamed up with Christian Nesmith, Mike's son, to make this record. Christian produced it, and I think he did probably, he probably did the arrangements too, some great arrangements on this record. And, you know, I was really excited when it was going to come out and then it came out, and I listened to a couple tracks, and I thought they were okay, but for some reason, I didn't really jump to listening to the whole thing. And I actually still don't own it. But I only really recently just kind of finally went, okay, you know what, I'm really just going to go through this record. And there's a lot of really good stuff on it. Mickey sounds great. Again, Christian's uh, arrangements and his production are great. There are a couple tracks that I don't like so much, but for the most part, it's really well done. The thing about Mickey is that his voice still sounds really good. He can still hit all the notes, and he just still sounds like Mickey. The only problem is, is that he... The thing about a lot of singers when they get older, they started to their, their voices start to get a little, uh, you know, kind of stiff. Their, their, their delivery starts to get a bit stilted and stiff, you know what I mean? And they don't... They, you know, it's a breath thing. You get older, and you don't have as much breath, and you don't... It, you know, it's a little tough to do those legato, soulful kind of runs. And so you start doing these really kind of like uh, 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 kind of uh, 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 phrasing kind of thing. And that's the problem with Mickey. He really sounds great, but I really wish that he wouldn't phrase like an old man. Yeah, I know he's old, and we're all going to get there. I'm getting there really right now. But I'm still not that big of a fan of that as a listener. But that's really the only thing I can say about it. I mean, that's not really a major, major thing. Like that's it's it's not a it's not a deal breaker. 
I mean, he still sounds great. He sounds especially good when his vocals are double-tracked. Then it's really like, wow, that's Monkey Mickey right there. I mean, he really, really sounds good. Now, of course, the track that I've chosen from the album is Don't Wait For Me. That's the song we're talking about. And now this is a cover of Mike's 1969 track from uh, the Instant Replay album. This Don't Wait For Me was originally on the Monkey's Instant Replay album. And Mickey does a really great solo acoustic version of it. It's just a, just a picking guitar, probably Christian on guitar, and Mickey doing a great vocal. I mean, one of the best modern day vocals from Mickey I've ever heard. Like, he really just has that it's the most youthful Mickey sounding voice, uh, vocal I think I've heard from him in decades, really. And, um, honestly, I'm gonna make a controversial statement right here. I like Mickey's version better. Yeah, I like this Mickey version better than the Mike version from the Monkees album. Yeah. I think because this one is folkier and the Nesmith one is naturally more country and I'm just not <clears throat> that much of a country guy. And I can get really heavily into stuff that is more country flavored, but that one was always one that I didn't just didn't like as much. This this Mickey version really, really, really uh, brings the song uh, to that place for me, man, where I can really get into it. Kiss coming in at number nine is Los Yesterdays with Nobody's Clown. Yeah, okay, so now Los Yesterdays is a group that was formed in Pasadena, California uh, around 2017. Uh, it was basically really just two guys basically in the beginning. It was a guy named Victor Benavidez, who was a vocalist, singer, songwriter guy, and his buddy uh, Gab Gabriel Rowland. Roland, Rowland, R O W L, you know, I don't know, whatever. Uh, and he was a producer and a drummer. And those guys worked up a bunch of really great, kind of lowrider oldies style tunes, original tunes, but very much in the style of the classic lowrider oldies and that sort of Little Anthony and the Imperials and Delphonics kind of vibe. And, uh, you know, recorded all these tracks. Well, these tracks made their way to Tom Brennick from Daptone. And, in, and he showed them to G Gabe Roth, also from Daptone. And uh, Tom Brennick is, is part of the Manhattan Street Band, and he is part of the, or was part of the Charles Bradley backing band. Gabe Roth, of course, part owner of Daptone, and uh, was uh, one, of the, one of the guys in Sharon Jones and the Dap Kings. Well, these two guys hit up the two guys from Lost Yesterdays and said, hey, why don't we form a four-piece and make this like a legit band, like a gigging band, and, you know, and, and put out records. And, of course, you know, Victor and Gabriel went, uh, yeah. So they started putting out a series of singles. I mean, there's, there's a couple, maybe two or three, I mean, Lost Yesterdays singles. They don't have an album yet, and they've been doing this since 2018. Daptone, sometimes when they start, it seems like they kind of get a slow start when they get new artists that they develop. You know, because people like uh, Charles Bradley, they were working with him for like for years before they finally put out an album. So it seems that's kind of where they are with Los Yesterdays. I'm really, really hungering for an album, but they really only have two or three singles so far. Now, I discovered this song back in February when it initially dropped. Ah, check me in my modern lingo, man. It dropped, man. So the, yeah, this came out in February, and I, I saw it right away because it came out, the single came out, and the video came out, and the video hit the internet, and I, I noticed it, and I took a look. And man, I was immediately blown away. Not only is the song great, but the video. You have to see the video. And now, the video features uh, a, a marionette by the name of El Triste, and El Triste was created by a puppeteer named King Cardias. Now, if you watch the video, there is a, a uh, cameo from one of the guys in the in the band, Victor, Bad Vic, Victor Benavidez, he's the get off my lawn guy with the with the garden hose. And the shopkeeper in the video is Kane Cardias, the guy who actually created the marionette, the puppet. And watch the video. I mean, you know, there're going to be links down in the description for all these tracks. Watch the video and watch the whole thing. I mean, it's so uh yeah, I'm not even going to go into it. It's just really great and it's really beautiful and I really love it and I cannot wait for these motherfuckers to put out an album. Get on it, guys. Okay, so coming in number eight is ABBA with Keep an Eye on Dan. Now, this comes from their, their new album, their reunion album from this year that came out in November called Voyage. 
I mean, you know about it. Everybody knows about this album because it was such a huge deal. Like, there's been a huge push and uh, a lot of advertisement and everything. It's just like, it's a, yeah. Next best thing to a new Beatles co- album coming out, apparently, the way it was, you know, hyped up, man. But, you know, it's been 40 years since they did their last album. And ABBA has a rabid fan base. And, yeah, I mean, we're, it, it is, for some people, it is like the Beatles doing new albums. So... I know I personally was pretty excited, and I'm not really... I'm, I'm a casual ABBA fan. I do love ABBA, and I always have, but I'm pretty casual. Now, this song, Keep an Eye on Dan, it was it was a little difficult to choose my favorite from the record uh, because I really had... I had it down to three songs. Now, really, when it comes down to it, my favorite track is Just a Notion, but that's a, that's a 1978 track that they just put on the album. I think ben, uh, Bjorn and Benny, they... Um, you know, they worked with it a bit. I think they redid the backing track or whatever, but the girls' vocals are definitely from 78. And really, it's just, for the most part, it's a vault track. So, I mean, I, I didn't really want to put that one on the list. I decided I was really going to choose my favorite from the proper new tracks. And it was neck and neck and neck between this song and uh, Don't Shut Me Down and No Doubt About It. Those are my three favorites of the new songs. Uh, the second song, I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head. That one's pretty good, too. But, so, yeah. So I kind of really just barely chose this one by the, you know, by hair. An ABBA reunion was something that really didn't seem like it was ever going to happen. I mean, it really seemed impossible. And they even said themselves that it was just never going to happen. But then around 2016... Suddenly, rumors started, you know, spreading, or you started seeing little bits of news like, oh, well, there's word that, you know, ABBA's going to do something this year. And I would always get excited thinking, oh, are they going to do some new music, a new album, a tour? And then it would turn out like, and then it turned out like, oh, yeah, they're doing this weird virtual tour with with these avatars or whatever. Um, Yeah, so, I mean, I wasn't that excited about that. But it turned out, really, that behind the scenes, Bjorn and Benny really were doing new music. They were really writing new songs because they were getting ready initially to do a TV special. There was a TV special that was in the works and they decided to do two new tracks for that. And uh, uh, I Still Have Faith in You and Don't Shut Me Down were recorded in like 2018 or something like that for this TV special that ended up not seeing the light of day. So when that fell by the wayside, Bjorn and Benny sort of attached themselves to this avatar thing, this this live show where these sort of virtual ABBA characters from 1979 go out and tour, or do a show, really. And so they thought, well, we'll give these two new songs to this project. And, well, then there was a third song. Then there was a fifth song. Then there was an eighth song. And then finally it was like, gee, we're, we're doing an album here. So they kind of, they went with it. They decided, you know, fuck it, let's just do an album. I mean, if we don't think it's good enough, we don't have to put it out. Let's just do it. And so they, they finished the album. And, you know, every single year there would be new announcements like, oh, well, this year the songs are going to come out. year would come ago, songs wouldn't come out. The next year, same thing, same thing, same thing. But this year they finally made an official announcement, no bullshit. In September... We're going to make the announcement. So come September, there was the announcement. They're going to do it. They have a new album coming out. And, of course, they announced the tour. Or It's not really a tour. I keep saying a tour. It's just really a show that's happening in England, in London, I think, in one particular venue. But when they announced the record, right then and there, they put out the two songs that they initially recorded for the TV special. And I... I heard them, I mean, I watched and listened that day, and I couldn't believe my ears. It was like, holy shit. It's just, it's just ABBA. It doesn't, they don't sound old. They don't sound like they're trying to attach themselves to some modern trend in hopes of selling records to younger kids. It's just ABBA, sounding like ABBA. And I was so, it was so cool. It was so exciting to hear this. And I mean, I immediately was like, I can't wait for the album. And everybody was reacting the same way. I'm going to Facebook and all my friends are posting, Oh my God, have you heard the new ABBA songs? I can't believe how good they sound. Yeah. And yeah, so when the album came out in November, you know, I still don't have a copy of this one yet either, but I have listened to it. And there are a couple songs I don't really like, but all kinds of great songs on it. And they sound great. Agnetha and, and, and Frida sound fantastic. I mean, they just sound absolutely great, and I just, I just think, well, come on, guys, 
keep up with this. I mean, why not just do this? Because they kind of said, well, after we put out this record, that's going to be it. But why? What is the point of that? You don't have to go out on the road. You know, the girls don't like to do interviews. Fine. But you enjoyed making the records, right? You enjoyed it making this album. You had a good time. You're excited by the outcome and the fun of the reception that it's get from the public. Why not keep doing it? What the hell else are you going to do? What, do you have, like, needlepoint to do or something? Make records. You're here. You have the ability to do it. You have your voices. Do it while you can, please. That is my plea to you, Abba, because I'm sure you're watching this video. So, yeah, there you go. And uh, so, really, this is kind of about me thinking this album is good. But, you know, I had to choose one song, you know, just by a little... Eh. So, yeah, there you go. Okay, so coming to number seven is David Crosby with his song Rodriguez for a Night. Now, this is from his album For Free, which came out in July. And, you know, he's been in a real late period renaissance in the last few years. It started in 2014. He put out an album called Cross. And really, since that album, he's just been wham, bam, 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 bam. I mean, there was a stretch there where he did an album every single year. And, I mean, he's done five albums in the last seven years, which is far more prolific than he has ever been. Ever. I mean, I'm talking including the 60s, including the 70s. He currently is the most prolific he's ever been uh, in terms of releasing albums in his entire life. Part of that is that I think, you know, he's well aware that he's at the end of his life. He doesn't know how much time he has left. He could die tomorrow. He could die next week. He could die in five years. But he has chosen to make the most of the time he has left. Basically, he's doing what ABBA needs to do, and a, lot of, and a lot of people in that sort of age range, and that is make as much art as he can in the time he has left. Make as much of what he does as high a quality as he can while he can. He's really, really, and, and he's really stepping up to the plate. Now, he's really a big Steely Dan fan. And that's kind of where he is at musically these days. Like, this track straight up sounds like Crosby singing for Steely Dan. It's not 70s Steely Dan. These, it sounds like that later Peter, period Steely Dan. You know those two reunion Steely Dan albums? It sounds... It's This track sounds straight off of one of those albums. But I'm not complaining because I'm a Steely Dan fan and I'm a David Crosby fan. So, I mean, you put those two together and... You put, you put the chocolate and the peanut butter and the peanut butter and the chocolate and... Come on, you can't fucking lose, can you? And and his voice. Crosby, it's ridiculous. His voice sounds fucking amazing. His voice sounds a thousand times better than it has any right to sound. And he'll tell you himself, I've watched interviews where people ask him, why do you sound so good? And he's like, man, I don't know. There's no reason why I should. I did everything wrong. Everything that I've done in my life leading up to this point should result in no voice. But yet, you know, Paul McCartney's vegan and is like croaking like a frog over here. David Crosby sounds like an angel. An angel. And, and he's writing good songs and, and, and creating great records. Now, this album, For Free, the, the title is for free, uh, for free because it's named after the Joan, uh, Joan Baez, the Joni Mitchell song because he covers that song. Joan Baez... She painted the cover image. So if you look at the cover, it's a painting. It's sort of a not-quite-finished painting of David Crosby. Joan Baez did that. So uh, go check it out. If you're a Crosby fan and you haven't really been listening to his new albums, go listen to them. I mean, you know, they're, they're a, little, a little adult contemporary, but then so is that later Steely Dan. But it's also good, you know, and he's always had that thing for uh, jazz chords and jazz vibes and jazz pop. It's there, man. Go check it out. Rodriguez for a Night. Great song. Okay, so coming in number six is Tears for Fears with The Tipping Point. Now, this track, The Tipping Point, is the title track from their new album, which is not going to come out until next year. It's set to be released in February 2022. But the track came out in October of this year, so it's making my list. And um, it's it's really good. It's a really great track. It's It sounds like a classic, a good classic Tears for Fears track. It does kind of have the, the, the same 
rhythm pattern as Everybody Wants to Rule the World, but it's not a retread. It's definitely its own song. It doesn't sound like Everybody Wants to Rule the World, but it sounds, like I said, like a great classic Tears for Fears track. Now, they, they don't make albums anywhere near as often as they should. I mean, they've been touring for years now. I mean, there was a period when Kurt Smith wasn't in it, and it was just basically Roland Orzabal and a bunch of backing guys going out as Tears for Fears, and they made a couple albums that way. But there came a point when Kurt Smith came back, and they reunited, and this would have been around 2003, 2004, and they did a new album called Everybody Loves a Happy Ending, and it was great. And there was a closest thing to heaven was a single from that. Fantastic. So good. And then they haven't made, they've toured and toured and toured, but they haven't made a new album until now. It's like, come on, guys. You listen to this track and you think these guys just don't miss a beat. Why are they letting all these years and decades go by not making records? This is another group that needs to take a tip from David Crosby. Come on, people. I mean, there's going to come a point in not very long from now where you're not going to be able to do this. You, you know, or you can write songs and record them, but the voice isn't going to be there or something. Like, take advantage, man. I mean, I'm sure that it's probably all a lot more work than they really want to do, you know. But, I mean, come on, isn't going out on tour a lot of work? I mean, that's probably a lot harder work than just making a record. Although, apparently, I guess they did have a little bit of a time making this one because, from what I understand, they actually recorded an initial version of the album that they scrapped and then they had to start all over again. So, yeah, I mean, stuff like that probably discourages you a little bit, but I don't know if they went through that with the previous album from 2004, but, I mean, whatever. It's part of the territory. Come on, Cheers for Fears. You, you have the ability to do it. Keep on doing it. Let's have another album in, you know, three years. How about three years? Is that a good time? Is that good for you? Let's write it down on the calendar, okay? All right, so coming in number five is Michael Kiwanuka with All My Life. Now, this is the B-side of his latest single, and the latest uh, single is called Beautiful Life. Now, this is a tr uh, Beautiful Life is a song that he wrote for a documentary. i got to read it. It's called Convergence, Convergence, Courage in a Crisis. My notes. Now, that's a documentary about individuals, uh, certain individuals, and how they sort of coped, were, were coping with the whole COVID situation, right? And Beautiful Life is this really great track that he wrote for that. But, you know, I kind of like this B-side just a little bit better all my life. It sounds like it's straight off his last album, Kiwanuka, from 2019, which was my favorite album that year. Like, absolutely, my tip-top album of 2019. And I just, you know, more of the same of that? Yeah, I'm in. Sign me up. Beautiful Life, I guess, really isn't exactly far off. It also could be in that same batch of tunes. I just like All My Life a little better. I mean, both songs are cinematic and dreamy and, and yeah, which is, you know, my bag, man. And, and I don't have a lot to say about the track because I don't know a lot about it. Really, everything that I know about it is that it's the B-side of this song. I know more about the A-side than I do the B-side. But anybody who knows Michael Kiwanuka's stuff and knows his style... You're not going to be disappointed with this. I understand he's actually working on a new... Well, from what I read... First I read album, and then I read somewhere EP. I hope it's not an EP, because, well... Why waste your time on EPs when you could be making full albums? Yeah. Anyway, so, yeah. Number five, Michael Kiwanuka with All My Life. Okay, so coming in number four is Ex Norwegian, featuring John Howard, doing Baby Walk Out With Your Darling Man. Now, this comes from the ex-Norwegian and Friends Sing Jimmy Campbell album, which came out in April. Now, ex-Norwegian is sort of this indie band from Miami Beach, Florida, who've been making records since 2009. And I'm only just hearing about them because of this album, and I only know about it because John Howard's on this track. Now, this album is a whole, you know, as you can tell by the name, it's a whole album of Jimmy Campbell covers, but it wasn't really something that they intended to do. Roger Howdale, How Howdiley, Howdale, I don't know how to pronounce his name. It's spelt like this. Yeah. Well, that guy, who's really like the main dude from Ex Norwegian, he had gotten he he'd gotten a bunch of new recording equipment uh, in the summer of 2020, and he was messing with it. He wanted to kind of you know y you record stuff to figure out how to how to use the gear to get familiar with it, and he just started recording songs, and it just kept being, he kept doing Jimmy Campbell covers. You know, he had a 
he got to the point where he realized he'd amassed like a half a dozen, a dozen Jimmy Campbell covers, and he thought, well, why don't why don't I do that? Why don't I let's make this a thing? Why don't I do this as an album? And he decided what he wanted to do was get a bunch of artists, like a whole bunch of other artists, to come in and contribute to the songs and do the vocals, maybe play a little bit, because he felt like he maybe couldn't quite do some of the vocals. Some of the, the vocals were out of his range or just not quite in his wheelhouse. So he brought 14 other artists in to sing on the individual tracks, one of which was the great John Howard, who sings on this song. And John absolutely shines like you would not believe on this. I mean, I love John Howard. He writes great songs and he's a great singer. But honestly, I think this may be one of his greatest vocal performances in my opinion. I mean, it's it's absolutely gorgeous. Now, Jimmy Campbell, this person who's being covered, he's a really obscure British, you know, UK singer-songwriter from the late 60s early 70s. He was in you know, he was in psych bands. He was in the, the 23rd Turnoff. And then later on, he did some solo albums. He did three solo albums in the early 70s. Well, from 69 to 72. The, the s- third album of the three was called, um, imaginatively titled, Jimmy Campbell's Album. Yeah, that's his 1972 album. That's the album that features this song. And this is actually Jimmy Campbell's own uh, favorite song of his own material. Now, Jimmy's own version of the song is very different from this one, as, as I guess it should be, right? But his version is very dry and kind of stripped down, and he has a voice that sounds kind of like a cross between Denny Lane and Neil Innes. Now, the ex-Norwegian and John Howard version is a lot more, uh, it's a lot more dreamy and, you know, has like a, a string pad that sort of runs throughout, kind of bubbling under, and it just, it has a bit more of a, of a, you know, dreamy atmosphere to it. But this, this is just, this sounds so great. This Everything about the the, the way the, the way the, the track is produced and the, just, just the sonic quality of it, the band with John singing over the top of it, I think, I listen to this and I think, you know what? I would really love to hear a whole album of John Howard with these guys as his backing band. You know, I would, that would be so, how amazing would that be? A new John Howard album with John Howard songs with ex Norwegian kind of creating the backing tracks. And man, it would be. Whew, boy, would that. That would be exciting. It's just, I think it's really a, a really. It's just sort of a marriage made in heaven for me personally. I, I, w- I would love to see it. Um, guys? Uh, uh, uh. Anyway, yeah. So, Baby Walk Out With Your Darling Man, Next Norwegian featuring John Howard. Do listen to it. You are going to like it. Okay, so coming to number three. Coming in at number three is Paul Stanley's Soul Station with I.O.I. Okay, now, Paul Stanley's Soul Station is a sort of a, a side project of Paul Stanley's that he started in 2015, where it's initially, where it really is mostly is just a band that does Philly soul and R&B covers. You know, like, could it be I, I'm Falling in Love by the Spinners and, uh, you know, Smokey and, you know, Ooh Baby Baby by Smokey and the Miracles and that kind of stuff. Now, they here and there would go out and do shows, you know, when on those rare occasions when Paul Stanley wasn't on the road with Kiss. So that was kind of something he would do on the side. Now, during lockdown in 2020, they decided to do an album. And most of it is made up of the covers that they've been doing, you know, live for all this time, for, you know, past five years or whatever. But, in addition to the covers, Paul Stanley wrote five original original songs that made the album. And they're really good. I mean, like, he wrote five songs in the style of the music that he's making on these records. Like, in that late 60s, early 70s, especially early 70s kind of vibe. And, man, he did a really good job. I mean... I, I, if you haven't heard it, it's it's really impressive. I mean, his his original material fits right in with the classic covers. I mean, shockingly so, because I mean, who would think that Paul Stanley could write and sing songs in this style that would stand up alongside these classic tracks? Man, he really managed it. I mean, in fact, you know, because the covers on this record are they're good. I mean, I guess they're pretty. 
faithful to the originals. I mean, he's really just kind of doing the straight straight covers of these songs. He didn't do any rearrangements of them. He's just singing the songs because he likes them. But yeah, but where this album shines is in the new material that stands right alongside these tracks. And that's this song IOI is one of those tracks. I can't I can't believe that Paul Stanley has had this in him. Now, of course, you know, Kiss fans are going to be sort of split on this. There's going to be a lot of people who are going to be like, this isn't rock, this sucks. You know, like the same people, they're going to be react to it the way they reacted to the Peter Criss solo album from 1978. But then there's a lot of fans, I mean, this, we're at this point now where a lot of Kiss fans are like complete sycophants, so no matter what they, you know, if Paul Stanley like farted into a microphone and put it out, they'd be like, oh my god, this is amazing, I never knew that I liked the sound of farts this much. You know, there's a lot of people like that, no matter what they do. Now, Part of what's so impressive about this album is that Paul Stanley's voice has been shot. Absolutely shot for the, pretty much the last 10 years, right? And, you know, some people won't admit it, but it doesn't change the fact. I mean, people go, well, well, I mean, come on, give him a break. I mean, he's older. He's, he's mid-70s. You try and sing. Blah, 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 blah. Like, eh, I don't care why it doesn't sound good. It just doesn't sound good. I mean, I'm not blaming the guy. I mean, I'm a fan. When I say Paul Stanley's voice doesn't sound good, it's not because I'm a, a hater and then I'm taking uh, uh, joy and saying, oh, oh, Paul Stanley can't sing. I'm a Kiss fan. I, it's a loss. I mourn the loss of Paul Stanley's voice, especially since they do, they have a tendency to do really cool things nowadays, like Paul Stanley doing this, or when they do the Kiss Cruise, they'll pull out all these great, crazy, like, you know, Wicked Lester you know, songs and stuff, and, and songs from The Elder and things, and you think, my God, I can't believe they're doing this, but Paul Stanley has no voice. It sounds terrible. I mean, if Paul Stanley still had his voice and they were doing that, it would be so exciting. So it's a huge loss that Paul Stanley has lo- doesn't have his voice anymore. I'm not, ta- I'm not delighting in this. But just the same, somehow he's managed to get some really good vocal tracks on this album. I mean... Let's be real. It's not because, ha, 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 you were wrong, hater. He can sing. Well, no. I mean, it's studio trickery. I mean, there's some underhanded sort of, you know, you know, magic going on down there in, inside the, you know, the computer lab down there. But it works. Somehow or other, it works. And the fact that he's doing it on soul tracks, who knew? I mean, you know, I'm, I'm happy that it works. I mean, I, I yeah, I couldn't be happier. Now, if Paul Stanley wanted to take go from this and do another album with Soul Station that was all original material, all original material written by him in this style, go right ahead, man. I am here for it. I'm in. I I will buy that. I will buy that. In fact, yeah. I mean, I could see that as being sort of a a way for him to go forward. To If he's not going to make any more new Kiss albums, if he started making records like that, I'm here. I'm here for it. Do it. Bring it. Okay, so coming in number two is Silk Sonic with Leave the Door Open. Yeah, yeah, you know this song. You've heard it a million times this year. It was on every awards show. I mean, I don't care what the awards were for. I don't care if the awards were like, you know, car dealerships. Like this, they, they, these, these two were on the damn thing singing this song, you know, and skate and whatever other tracks they had going. Now, this, this song dropped earlier in the year. I forget exactly when. It was like, it was like mid, maybe summer when it was. I don't remember now. But I remember all of a sudden it came out of nowhere. And I was like, holy shit, it kind of blew my mind. Now, I've been a, a fan of Bruno Mars since his second album, Unor- Unorthodox Jukebox. When his first album came out, I remember, I mean, I didn't know about him. I hadn't heard the name. I was just in the grocery store one day, and one of the hits from that album, The Lazy Song, was playing. And I'm going, what is this fucking terrible song? Who is this? And I pulled out my, my phone and like to listen and, and identify the track for me. I'm like, uh, Bruno Mars. The Lazy Song. Oh, okay, well, and now I know I hate Bruno Mars. So, yeah, that was that. Bruno Mars was yet another new artist that I hated. And I, and I still really hate that track. I think The Lazy Song sucks. 
So then a couple years later, uh, he put out a second album, Unorthodox Jukebox, and ahead of that album was the song Locked Out of Heaven. And I heard that, and I was like, holy shit, this is really good. Like, it kind of sounded like a late 70s police track. I was like, wow. I mean, I was really like, this is really impressive. I thought it was a great song. And then... I, you know, all you know, then all the other singles started coming out from that record, and I was like, "Wow, this is really good stuff." I mean, and I went and I listened to the album, the whole album, and I became, I became a Bruno Mars fan. I realized that he wasn't, you know, this douche. He wasn't really the douche from the Lazy Song. I don't know. I don't know what's up with that, but yeah, I still don't like that song. But yeah, I became a Bruno Mars fan. Now, the thing about Bruno is that sometimes he does stuff I like. And sometimes he does stuff that I don't like. You know, the album that came out after that, 45 Carat, whatever the hell it's called, I that came out and I was excited. Oh, cool, new Bruno Mars, and I took a listen to it. And it was just not my no. not my steez, man. A little bit too kind of modern dance, hip-hop influence kind of stuff, and I, that wasn't my thing. But his influences are... Vast. Like, he has so many different kind of styles and, and influences. And he's almost kind of like... I mean, honestly, I consider Bruno Mars to be the modern Michael Jackson. I mean, he's on that level, it, talent-wise. Like, he could play multiple instruments. He's got the voice. He's got the presence. He's, he, he can, he's got the moves. Yeah, I mean, he's really nearly MJ level. You know, if, as close as we're going to get to another MJ kind of performer. I mean, he's, he's got the goods. So when this came out, him teaming up with Anderson Pack, doing this kind of 70s soul you know, sort of smooth soul kind of vibe thing. You kidding me? Sign me up. And immediately when I heard this track, I was so excited and I thought, okay, when's the album coming out? Is it coming out next week? Next month? Is it out now? Where is it? I want to buy it right now. Well, no album. And so then, you know, they do 18 more award shows and that kind of thing and everybody's going, woo! All right, and, and you know, and the excitement kind of builds for everybody. And I, you know, I I follow them on Instagram and the whole thing. And everybody's going, "Where's the album? Where's the album? Album, guys? Okay, yeah, great. You're on another award show, another picture of you guys. You know, where's the album? And they just kind of really, we're just kind of sitting back, going, hmm, and not really, not really divulging anything. They're not really, they weren't really giving any information. And they strung us along for months. And finally, the album didn't come out until November, but by the time it came out in November, a lot of the excitement had worn off for me. I just kind of got to the point where, I mean, you know, like Skate came out as a single, great track. I forget what the other one, it was uh, 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 Smoking Out the Window, pretty good, but not as good as the other two. I listened to the album right when it came out, and I did like it, and I do like it, but they took so long to finally put this record out that I just, yeah, like I said, a lot of the excitement for me had waned by the time it did come out. But this track, I still love it. I mean, come on, I still have it at number two. This is easily the number two track of the of the year for me. And it just, it really taps right into that thing that I love. I mean, it's 70s is all get out, which I'm a sucker for, duh. And But it's not just 70s, it's done by somebody who can really, really capture it. And there's a lot of humor in it. I mean, there's a lot of inside jokes in, in the songs and in, in the presentation, but it, not uh, uh, in a way of making fun of 70s or, in, or in making fun of what they're doing. It's just, there's just humor in the, in the lyrics and in the presentation. And one of the things I really love about this track is that initially Anderson Pack, who plays drums and sings, and he did this song, by the way, in one take. Yes, well, he did the drum track for this for this song in one take. So, initially, he's he's singing lead, right? But then what happens is that you get to the B section and you cut to Bruno on the keyboards over there, and he sings his part, and it just boom goes up to the next level. It's kind of like Journey. Hear me out. On Infinity, when you have Steve Perry and you have Greg Raleigh, and feeling that way too, right? The song starts, right, and you have Greg Raleigh coming in, and he sounds great, because Greg Raleigh is great, and he has a great voice. It's a great song. All right, this is great. I'm in. Let's do this. And then the next section comes in, and Steve Perry comes in, and woo, right into the stratosphere. And that is exactly 
the effect that this track has going from Anderson Pack, who's already already killing it, to Bruno Mars, and it's just woo to the next planet up. And yeah, that's just it's so cool. It's such 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 a great track. Okay, so coming in at number one, my number one favorite track of 2021. Los Retros with It's Got to Be You. Yeah, it's got to be you by Los Retros. This is such a good track. This is such a good track. I'm kind of cheating a little bit because it's actually an old track, but uh, it came out, basically it came out on this year on an EP called Looking Back. And it came out in, when did it come out? In April. April. And, but the track actually was recorded like in 2017 or 2018. Now, Los Retros is uh, a 21-year-old multi-instrumentalist by the name of Mari Tapia uh, from Oxnard, California. Now, when he was eight, when Mari was eight, he had a, his older brother had a guitar in the house and, you know, wouldn't allow him to touch it. But when his brother was out, you know, out hanging out, he wasn't home, Mari would go and sneak the guitar and mess around with it. And over time, he taught himself how to play guitar. And then he just kind of moved on from, like, kept going from there. By the time he was 16, he was a multi instrumental He knew how to play several instruments, and he'd gotten his hands on a 90s four-track machine and started writing and recording songs. And uh, the music that he was writing and recording was very much influenced by the music that he was exposed to from his parents when he was growing up. His parents were listening to a lot of Central and South American soft rock and uh, alt-pop from the 70s and 80s. And he really just loved that music. And so that is very much what influenced, the, the, one of the heavy influences of the music that he makes. So when he would record all these tracks, he, he sort of amassed a, a bunch of songs and he started putting them, on, putting them up on the internet. And, you know, SoundCloud and that sort of thing. And he built up a really big online following. You know, and started playing shows, you know, put a band together and started doing live shows and things. And, you know, in Southern California, he really started to build a, a major following. And he got the attention of the label Stone's Throw, who signed him in 2019. Now, when initially they were called Retrospect, and, and you know, Mari put together a full, like, 11-track album that he, I think was one of the things that he put up online initially. But ever since... Stone's Throw uh, uh, signed them. They've only done EPs. I don't know why that is. You guys, you need to do a full album, will you? But now, Maury changed the name from Retrospect to Los Retros uh, as sort of a, an homage to this band right here. Yeah, so that, that's the album. That's a copy of the album that he, you know, that he grew up with listening to as a kid, and that's what influenced the name. Now, he hasn't done it entirely on his own. I mean, you know, like I said, he formed a, a live band, and uh, his right-hand man is Chase Sun... Uh, let me look. Chasen Nusolia. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. I'm probably butchering the name, but, you know, whatever. It's spelt like this. Yeah. Well, he plays bass in the band. Now... Uh, Mari's wife, Lupe, uh, often plays keyboards in the band. Sometimes she's playing in the live band, playing keyboards. Sometimes she's not in it. But, you know, she's definitely a recurring uh, character in this whole thing. Now, um, and then I guess his, one of his brothers plays drums. Okay. So, so over the, this, the course of this past year, I've really become a big fan of Los Retros. They're, like, they're my favorite current band right now. And, you know, picked up all the EPs and grabbed, you know, whatever I could offline and that sort of thing. And, or online. And, well, just a few months ago, it turned out that they were going to be on the road. I saw that they were going to be on the road with Chicano Batman. Now, Chicano Batman's okay, but they're, they're, but they definitely have a following and they're definitely popular. And they were on the road with Los Retros as the uh, opening act. And they were set to be here in New York at Webster Hall. Excellent. I'm going to get to see Los Retros. I'm going to buy a ticket. So when that, that show went on sale, I went and I looked it up, and it wasn't very expensive. It was like a, what, a $40 ticket or something. What was, no, it was like a $25 ticket or something, whatever it was. I forget now. All I know is that I looked it up, and I was going to buy a ticket, but then all the, you know, the extra added fees and all this kind of stuff, and I thought, you know, whatever. I'm just going to wait. I'm, I'm going to go see if I can just go to the box office and get a ticket and not pay, you know, because the fees come in, and it seems like it... The price doubles, right? So that was the that was the idea. 
Well, I kept not going and not going and not going. And then one day I pulled up the website and went to look, and the tickets had sold out. <clears throat> so apparently Chicano Batman does in fact have quite a following. You know, it could be Los Retros as well. Well, so yeah, so there you go. I was shit out of luck and I wasn't going to get to go to the show. But I thought, you know, I'm going to go over there. Or, you know, bands when they're on tour, they show up at the venue around 3.30, 4. That's when they're, they're supposed to show up around 4. Around 3.30, 4 is when they show up because they have to do sound check. So I'm going to go sort of pop over there around that time in the afternoon around and uh, bring a record with me and see if maybe... Maybe I'll see him. Maybe I'll get to meet him or whatever. And so I went over there, and I brought my uh, I brought one of my records with me. And sure enough, Mari and Lupe were just hanging out right outside Webster Hall. And I went up and I started start talking to him. Hey, you know how you doing? I'm I'm a fan. I'm here to to stalk you. And uh, yeah. Anyway, sorry. No, I don't have a gun really. And yeah, but really, I ended up kind of shooting 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 the shit as it were with these guys for a little bit. And got him signed my record and everything, and then uh, a bunch of kids came up, like some pretty young, like maybe late teens, early twenties, came up, and they seemed really excited to bump into these guys on the street. So I'm thinking, okay, maybe there there's some kids who really like this band, and so I was all done, and I kind of walked away and left them to sit there and talk to these kids. And then as I walked away, I thought, I didn't get a picture. <laughs> yes, I'm a total fanboy. So I went back and said, hey guys. Mind if I take a picture? They're like, sure, yeah. So I went to get a picture with them, and I handed my phone over to a couple, one of the kids who were talking to them. W- would you mind taking the photo? Sure. And just as we're taking the photo, here's, here's a couple of the photos here. As we're taking the photo, Maury looks over at me, and he goes, how old are you? <laughs> and so I'm, I'm, I'm 52. I'm 52. I was like, oh, okay. And we took the photos, and he's like, well, yeah. I hang out with a lot of guys around your age. And I thought, oh, okay. Well, uh, yeah, I guess, you know, you're a musician. You hang out with a lot of musicians. And a lot of musicians in the L.A. area, probably older guys, right? And he said, yeah, well, you know, and the guys from Stone, from the label, Stone's Throw. I said, oh, yeah, yeah, that's probably older. Yeah, the guy owns the labels about around your age. Okay, sure. And, uh, you know, so I said to him, I said, well, you know, now you know you've made it. Once old guys are coming up to you and asking for your autograph and for pictures, that means you're where you want to be. I'm here to tell you. So, yeah, anyway, I didn't get to see the show, but I got to meet those guys. But I, I really do wish I could have seen the show because then the next day they were on the highway to go to Chicago to do the next gig and they got in a car accident. They're okay. Everything's fine. Nobody died. Nobody, you know, they're, they're okay. But then they ended up just like canceling the rest of the shows. Chicano Batman continued on, but Los Retros basically went home and decided, you know, they're going to go back on the road later at some other time. And, uh, yeah. So, damn. I snoozed and I lost. But really, go check out this song and check out all these songs. Okay, so there you go. My top 10 songs of 2021. Um, As I mentioned earlier, I'm putting links in the description below. I'm going to put the whole list down there. Hopefully you didn't look ahead of time and see what I was going to have on my list. But the list is all down there with links under each title, uh, YouTube links, where you can go and listen to the songs or watch the videos or whatever. I highly recommend it. And, uh, yeah, go go check out this stuff if you don't already know it. I'm Obviously you already know ABBA and you already know, you know Silk Sonic and that kind of stuff. But, yeah, go listen to Los Retros. Go listen to Los Yesterdays. Go listen to, yeah, I mean, listen to the ex-Norwegian and John Howard track. Listen to all that stuff. Some really great tracks. And, uh, yeah. Well, anyway, so that is that's that, that wraps up the year. Thank you, everybody, for all the people who are watching the videos and who are subscribing. And uh, as I always say, and uh, if you haven't subscribed yet, subscribe. And if you subscribe, ring the little bell or click the little bell for, for notifications, all right? You know, comment and like and all that stuff. And, uh... I'll see you next year.